Hello, this is Joel Blackford with Beth Hesson Sabbath Fellowship at 1631 Ford Parkway, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55106. Please join us sometime. We meet every Sabbath in St. Paul from 1130 until sunset, and we'd love to see your face. So the news this week, this Sunday night meeting, is recorded a little bit early because Israel needs to go to Putin and Russia and and ask for the right to declare war against Iran and Syria and uh, Lebanon and Gaza, for that matter. And so the talks were due to occur on 221. And so Netanyahu was going to fly up tomorrow and meet with Putin. Well, they were delayed. I think it's because of election issues. Who knows what's going on in Israel right now, but something delayed it. And I think it could be God delaying it too. And I'll give you a reason for that in a while. So it was delayed as of 2.20 of 2019. And so Iran is fomenting war across the world right now, and especially against Israel, which is antichrist because you can't kill off the Jews. They are a blessing from God. So keep in mind that when this man, Zavad Zarif, is in Munich, and keep in mind right down the road is Berlin, which is going to be the seat of the Antichrist at some point in time in the future as Germany becomes a military power across the world and Europe with them. But this man is fomenting war and accusing Israel, and he's just plotting and strategizing with the other Iranian leaders. And once again, Iran is 97% business people and moms and dads and wonderful people and 3% crazy nutballs in a genocidal war cult. We'll get to that later on. So Zarif warns this risk of Israeli behavior is putting international law on the shelf and U.S. behavior is doing the same thing. And uh, Netanyahu is sparring verbally in the news media back and forth with Iran each day. And he knows he has to deny Iran nuclear weaponry and block its military entrenchment in Syria. He knows that. He has to knock them out. So he was planning to go meet with Putin and get that approval. I believe the United States is already on board, but Putin is the last step on this. Israel is striking in Syria at will right now, and occasionally they knock some Russian uh, military devices out or some Russians. And so he wants to make sure that he doesn't kill any Ru Russians and gets the Russians out of Syria and possibly out of Iran before he attacks. But this has to happen. It isn't World War III but it will be more like a fourth seal war, and you'll see much more death as a result of this. The Iranian leaders are part of a Mahdi death cult. They want to bring the 12th Imam, the Mahdi, and they want it immediately. And so they want to hasten it. They want to bring this fellow. So they've had other Mahdi's before, but this is the 12th one. You would know him as the Antichrist. They want to bring him forth, and they believe in killing Jews, and that will bring him forth. This is Ayatollah Khomeini from the 70s, and so Europe is pro-Iranian. Um, this is an article from the Gatestone Institute, and what they're saying is that Europe doesn't care. They want to trade Jewish blood for oil, and they only care about the fact that Iran is sitting on a pile of oil. They don't care about how many Jews would die if Iran would attack them time and time and time again or cause a world war over this. They don't care about that. And one more time, I want to mention that Berlin, Germany will be the seat of the Antichrist. So really, the EU is cowardly, lazy, and pathetic, and they care only about oil and not blood. The time has come for our European partners to stop undermining U.S. sanctions. So the problem is the United States is sanctioning Iran and Europe's going, we're going to work our way around this and, and avoid all of this. So they're going to set up a necessary framework to pursue legitimate trade with Iran, regardless of what Iran is fomenting in terms of war. So war will begin. It's a matter of when. The Iranian regime openly advocates another Holocaust and it seeks the means to achieve it. That's Pence talking about that, our VP. He was at the Munich conference too, but nobody was listening to him. So when he mentioned all of these things at the conference, it's like no one applauded, no one, no one even acknowledged that there is a problem, that, that Iran is a cancerous tumor. And so... Europe could care less. They want their oil. They don't care about lives. Do you remember this from a few weeks ago on January 10th of 2019? All the locusts showed up in Saudi Arabia. Well, that was during Parsha Bo, which is about 
the eighth plague of locusts coming into Egypt. And then right after that, after the 10th plague, the Israelis get to leave. And so Mexico also was hit during that same week during both. So there was two witnesses of that. Well, now during this week, which is Kisisa or Thisa, depending upon if you're Ashkenaz or Sephardi, this partial begins when we take a census to ransom their souls in advance of a planned war so that God won't find any of them guilty of taking a life in battle. God was sending another message to Torah keepers. Are we noticing? There's Bo, that's from a few weeks ago in January, but war was postponed for what reason? On 221, BB planned to fly to Russia to discuss the terms of war with Iran and their proxies. It was postponed. War, war is planned. Don't worry about that. It's going to happen because Iran is ready to go. They've, they've created the crazy environment where they have the missiles and they have the technology and they just want to bring their 12th Imam, this Antichrist figure, into the world and they want to hasten it. So, and God is warning Israel to collect their half shekels to atone for their souls when the war will begin, possibly soon. There is a This is a veiled first fruit Hebrew reference. And so if you check in the Hebrew with me, you'll see it. The Midrash also connects the Hebrew phrases to Numbers 31, 50 through 52, where a thousand from each tribe fight against Midian, 12,000 of them total, and none of them died. Very intriguing. It's like the 144,000. According to a few sources, the Midian War, where 12,000 fight and live, relates to Revelation 21, 18 through 27, which is the New Jerusalem, where these warriors are the first fruits of the 144,000, which become the literal walls, the precious stones, likened to the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, the head Kohen in New Jerusalem. So the census, why do we take a census? And I said to Moses, when you take a census of the people in Israel and register them, each upon registration is to pay a ransom for his life to Adonai to avoid any breakout of a plague among them during the time of the census. Everyone subject to the census is to pay an offering to Adonai, half a shekel, one fifth of an ounce of silver by the standard of the sanctuary shekel. A shekel equals 20 geras. Everyone over 20 years of age, everyone over 20 years of age who is subject to the census is to give this offering to Adonai. The rich is not to give more and the poor less than the half shekel when giving Adonai's offering to atone for your lives. You are to take the atonement money from the people of Israel and cause it uh, to be for the service of the tent of meeting. And so in it, it will be a reminder of the people of Israel before Adonai to atone for your lives. There's a depth behind that, and I'll show you that. So this is from the Sosino Press Pentateuch, which is a, a Torah um, that was very popular before World War II. So it's very Christian friendly, if you can imagine that. So from page 352, the law of the shekel, whenever a census of the warriors was taken, every Israelite was to pay a half shekel okay their number they're they're mustering as an army before going to war a ransom now keep in mind this is a kofar and it's not a kafar which is a covering but it's similar okay it's a ransom a price for a ransom of a life spelled like kafar atonement the technical expression for ransom occurs three times in the torah and each time it refers to money paid by one who is guilty of taking a human life in circumstances that do not constitute murder nope it's not murder. Thus, the owner of the ox that had killed a man after the owner had received warning that the animal was dangerous was charged with the death of the man, but his crime was not intentional. He was permitted to pay a ransom, a kofar, such as a uh, ransom was forbidden in the case of deliberate murder. This is the conception that underlies the law of the half shekel in this chapter. The soldier who is ready to march into battle, like Israel, is ready to march into Iran and into uh, Syria and other places like that, is is in the eyes of heaven a potential taker of life, though not a deliberate murderer, hence he requires a ransom for his life before he goes to war. When thou numberest them, the soldier is to be impressed with the fact that as high as he aims for which he, these aims that he goes into battle may be, war remains a necessary evil. The ransom is therefore to be paid at the time of the mustering long before the actual fighting begins. Plague, it's negeth. And that word is very interesting. It's not like debar or deber, it is negeth. The word comes from the same root as the Hebrew word for slaughter in battle. And a noted character and they don't normally cite 
Karaite Jews anymore, not after Nehemiah Gordon. Uh, this commentator translates the phrase that they suffer not defeat in battle. So it's all connected together. The census is taken before the battle, like a truma, so like a first fruits. When thou numberest them according to the above explanation, this phrase would begin in verse 13, everyone that passes before the officers mustering the forces for battle, the shekel for the sanctuary, the full weight shekel is used in connection with sacred things, teruma, contribution, and it was used before, but it's also going to be used in Numbers 3152 in that area. So we'll show you the connection in a while. 20 years, the Israelites' military age, you can't go to battle when you're 14, 15, 18, 19, other than David, <laughs> but that's a different case. They're 20 years of age, and that's when they can come into service of military. And the poor shall not give less. All the souls are of equal value in the eyes of, the, of God, hence all are to give the same ransom. Nefesh is our animal soul, which can die and does die. To make atonement for your souls, the nefesh, kafir la kafir, all nefeshotakem. Okay, so that is a plural, and it's your souls, okay? And that is the animal soul, again, that could potentially die. So this phrase is an amplification of kefir, and is repeated in the next verse. Even a rationalist like Ehrlich rightly sees, and I don't know who Ehrlich is, but he must be a rationalist, sees in the use of this last phrase one of the sublimest teachings of the scripture, unparalleled in any other sacred book, ancient or modern. The same phrase is used in connection with the Midianite battle and Numbers 31:52, as we've talked about before, after signally defeating the Midianites, the victorious warriors come to the tabernacle, bringing jewels and other valuable booty as an offering in order to make atonement for their souls before the Lord. Other people sing songs of triumph after a victory over their enemies. Why did these warriors offer sacrifices of atonement for their souls for su at such an hour? Asks Ehrlich. It is another indication of the horror of shedding human blood that the Torah inculcates. It is the same feeling that prompted the Jewish sages to tell the angels when they were about to break forth in song over the Egyptian host drowning in the Red Sea. They were silenced by God in the words, My creatures are perishing, and ye are ready to sing. So, what comes up next is washing and anointing the ministers. For the service, the silver of the, of the shekels was used for the basis of the pillars of the sanctuary. That might be likened to the two witnesses, Boaz and Yaquim, and also for the hooks to keep the boards together. So it goes in for special service, a memorial, i.e. that the Lord remember the children of Israel in grace. There's always been grace. It's Ken, okay? And yes, it too, for that matter, are the name of our place. And grant them atonement for blood shed in battle. In later ages, the half shekel became an annual tax devoted to maintaining the public services of the temple, and the daily worship was thus carried on by the entire people and not by the gifts of just a few rich donors. At the present day, the memory of the half shekel is still kept alive by the reading of Exodus 30, uh, 2, uh, 16, on uh, 11 through 16, rather, um, on the Sabbath before the month of Adar, with the special haftor, shekelim, and donating half of the value of a current silver coin to some worthy charitable cause on Purim. Next, the labor for ritual washing and the anointing oil, the two witnesses, I'm likening it again, for consecrating the tent of meeting, which could pop up during the end times, and those who minister therein. Then the mark of Sabbath is specified uh, in Exodus. So we're talking about Tetzave, which is the breastplate of the priest and, and the holiness associated with that. And we're going to go all the way to Revelation with this. So just keep that picture in mind. Here's an artist's recreation of this. The tribes that he's listing may or may not match up exactly with those stones. He's got the stone order in, uh, correct. But do the tribes actually match with those? I don't know. But it's still intriguing for you to see. 1,000 from each tribe. So we are now in Numbers 31. 12,000 total, and it's like 144,000. The officers in charge of the thousands who fought, the commanders of the thousands and the commanders of the hundreds, approached Moshe and said to him, Your servants have counted all the soldiers under our command, and not one of us is missing. That's the likening to the 144,000. Not one of them will be missing. We have brought an offering for Adonai, what every man has obtained in the way of gold jewelry, armlets, bracelets, signet rings, earrings, and belts to make atonement for ourselves before Adonai. 
the offerings of the 144,000 become the precious walls. And you'll see this connection, so read very careful with me. Uh, Moshe and Eleazar the Cohen accepted their gold, all the jewelry, all the gold in this gift, which the commanders of the thousands and the commanders of the hundreds set apart for Adonai, weighed 420 pounds. For the soldiers had taken booty, every man for himself, Moshe and Eleazar the Cohen, took the gold from the commanders of the thousands and the hundreds and brought it into the tent of meeting as a reminder for the people of Israel before Adonai. It's a reminder all the way through to Revelation 21. So now let's read Revelation 21. This is the new city of Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And the city, and this is in King James, so just deal with it. It, it, it actually reads better in King James. And the city lieth four square, and its length as large as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, and the length and the breadth are the, and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof in 144 cubits, like 144,000, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Then continuing on in Revelation 21, and the foundation of the wall of the city was, were garnished, in all the manner of precious stones, the first foundation, jasper, second, sapphire, third, chalcedon, chalcedony, the fourth, an emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, sardius, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, and the ninth, topaz, and then the tenth, chrysophora, phosphorus, the eleventh, a jacinth, and the twelfth, an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, and it were trans, as if it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple, no naos, that's the Holy of Holies there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were the naos of it, the Holy of Holy of it. Where we are right now in the sequence is that we've gone through seal one, which is coming against the west, seal two, which is against the east of Jerusalem. It's all linear. Seal three uh, is starting to affect the northern climbs. Seal four is coming up at some point in time. Once again, it's linear. Seal five will be uh, Shekin, which is ritual sacrifice of human beings um, for, for Yeshua. And then seal six is cosmological problems. So run through it one more time just so you can see where we go through these sequences in a linear fashion. First seal is against the West. It happened about 1967 as Moshe Dayan won the war and then handed back the Temple Mount and delayed everything by 50 years. Then the second seal is east of Jerusalem and that is when Cheney and Bush and the other neocons started wars that won't end. This is the second seal wars and it's based on 9-11 in 2003 when we went to Libya and Iraq and all these other countries and just started destroying those nations, all the oil producers. You'll notice that. Then seal three was prophesied as being Hurricane Sandy on that November time frame, October 31st through November of 2012. And Jeroboam's false Sukkot was during that time frame. And it, uh, we believe that it occurred after Op 9 of 2012. And the basic food prices for the poor people, they'll notice that they're going to go up, but the wine and the oil, the rich people could care less. Seal 4, we're waiting for that to occur. That would kill 1.8 billion people. Seal 5 is that, that ritual sacrifice of the believers that end up under the altar in heaven in Revelation. The sixth seal is coming up at some point in time. Once we get through with the big four, the four horsemen, the other two probably will happen faster, and then we'll go into that eerie silence for the seventh seal for half an hour. Are we at the Jubilee time frame? Are we ready to have some of these things kick off? We've been waiting for years. We've been seeing all these signs from 1918 and 2017, and now we'll have another one, another eclipse coming up on 2024. These are patterns, but does it mean that Yeshua is returning during this exact time frame? We don't know, but it seems like things are starting to move forward. We've seen another set of signs. These eclipses come and go. We've seen 40 total eclipses that all match up equidistant and perfect. And then 10 of them were blood moon eclipses, four of which were part of the Tetrad from 2014, 2015. And then it's over nine years. They're all ending right now. So it's time to be patient. According to Sadhu Sundar Severage, he says the time of the two witnesses is soon. It's months, not years. And then they'll release the anointing. So we are done with this series, and this is our next Sunday night video, so thank you for joining me.